Welcome back, and it's the third hour of Fridays. Of course, it's the... Uh, uh, and i got to thank you, John, uh, for setting us up so we could have Professor Jim McCanny on the program regularly. He's on every Wednesday now, and I know he's on your program. Really appreciate that. He's also been working with History Channel 2 on uh, 2012 Countdown to the Apocalypse. And it's great to have an, a, an astrophysicist and astronomer uh, that has literally been the first and probably the most important person explaining to the public and other scientists about the plasma and the electric universe. Uh, so welcome back, John, and tell us what, what are the main things that are happening. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna, thank you for being having me on. Uh, I am in a remote location, so just a real quick report. Professor McCanning did something scientists don't do unless they're absolutely certain. In no unequivocal, unequivocal terms, he states that what Hurricane Sandy did, making that 90-degree turn uh, towards New Jersey <coughs> and New York, <coughs> simply it cannot happen under natural conditions. He uh, says that he worked with the Russians uh, on space-based laser technology in the late 90s, and he's convinced that what was done was a laser-based uh, manipulation of that storm to make that 90-degree turn. And yeah, it could yeah, not happen yeah. otherwise. Uh, I can fill in a little bit of the blanks in that. But what I was told when I was a doctor taking care of pilots flying out of Peterson and Buckley and U.S. Space Command, what they do is they salt the upper atmosphere with the robot drones, uh, at the high atmosphere between 73 and 80,000 feet. And once they have those nanoparticles, they have a target. And they lay them out in a grid-like pattern. And what they do is they use either HARP or space-based lasers. They don't just need to use HARP. Okay, so when people say, well, I want to see HARP. Space-based lasers can actually lay what's called a, uh, a plasma line or lay a line where they superheat the upper atmosphere because they have these particles that act as a target, uh, nanoparticle, thorium, barium, and aluminum. And when they superheat them, they create a plasma, and that actually can cause storm cells to kind of come together like a pinwheel. They can literally move it around like a joystick. Uh, right. They can dispense and storms, they and they can create them. Yeah, and that's what they did. Exactly. And it's really pretty simple. And you don't need a lot of energy. You can actually, it's almost like moving a top. With a very tiny amount of energy, once you create these plasma vortex lines, you can actually steer uh, storm cells. You can move them together. You can dispense them apart. Uh, you can move air masses to create rain. Uh, it's you know, and the thing is, we have what's called satellite-based, high-resolution 3D Doppler radar. Now, the the regular gave Hussein Obama the opportunity to put on his bomber jacket with presidential right. seal, on, seal on it and fly yeah. around looking very presidential, looking very no, no. commander in chief. The week right. before the election, that may have been exactly. Yeah, that's that's what it was all about, and also putting the stop to the surge. There were a number of reasons why Romney lost. The first one, of course, is a lot of people didn't support him because it was there was a, obviously a fracturing of the base. Uh, you know, you're going to have a Mormon not going to be supported by many Christians. You're going to have uh, the Tea Party and the Libertarians not want to support him. Uh, I, I've personally voted for Romney because I thought this was important to deal with issues, pro-life issues, financial issues, and yes, he is at least a wannabe globalist, but it would have given us breathing space. We don't have breathing space now. Uh, within days, and, with, uh, yeah. one of the things I want to ask your opinion, because I know you're, uh, you're, a former, you're a special forces and a trainer, you train people now, uh, you're actually a prep consultant, so people want to know how to prep, they should consult with you. We don't have time anymore. They're going to fast track the financial implosion of the economy. They're going to fast track uh, gun grabs with the U.S. Small Arms Treaty. They're going to fast track trying to outlaw any semi-automatic weapons, and uh, they're really going to push the envelope until they see what kind of response they get from the public. I think they're oh, anticipating. They're push till they get a pushback. People are, you know, Dr. Bill. People are always looking for a date. Forget about a date. You need yeah, to I know, yeah. set your priorities and work on your priorities ASAP. Yeah. And and just disregard a date. Work on your priorities. Get your essentials squared away as soon as possible. That's where where we are right now. Yeah, I, I wouldn't put a date, but I would say the likelihood of a I call the devil's menu of what is likely to happen is in the next two to four years we're going to have a financial you know crash, and it, it won't be permanent. It'll be temporary, but very painful. We're going to have a devaluation of the dollar. That's going to happen because of hyperinflation. The fiscal cliff is going to happen somewhere or another, although they're going to tell us that they've reduced the pain there, but it's not. With Obama, he wants to build down the military or kind of defund it. That's really dangerous. And also his policy towards support of Israel is, even if you don't agree with Netanyahu and you don't personally get along with him, we need to integrate our military forces, not for a preemptive attack, but for preemptive defense. And if necessary, kind of what I call micro uh 
uh, engineered attacks like special forces coming in to get rid of these weapons that are stored in Syria. We don't need to invade the country or support al-Qaeda. We need to make sure they don't use these dang weapons. And um, Absolutely. Because if they use them against Israel, Israel is going to go crazy. It's almost like uh, Hatfields and McCoys. But now we, 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 it's the 21st century version of the Hatfields and McCoys. The McCoys now have had one of their sons as a genius, and he's uh, like back to the future. He's gone to the future and brought back you know 25th century weapons. So now the other guys come over the hills with their, with their squirrel guns, and now he's got a gun that literally can vaporize them and literally shove them into another dimension. When they attack Israel, Israel is going to let loose, and it's going to be like, oh, my gosh. And, and nobody, including the Russians or Chinese or us, will be able to stop them. If they try to crush the Israelis, the Israelis are going to release, and they call it this, the Samson option. So uh, I, I agreed with the logic of Romney, even though some people call him a warmonger. No, you have to deal like Ronald Reagan from a position of strength, and then war doesn't happen. War happens only when you're weak or you lead from behind like Obama, or you lie and you supply arms to Al-Qaeda, and then you literally sacrifice an ambassador who is not behaving because he doesn't want to agree with the transfer for weapons, which is where the what was going on. I heard from my reports that Ambassador uh, Stevens was actually not agreeing with all this massive transfer because he knew it was going to the bad, bad guys, the Al-Qaeda, the graduates of Camp X-Ray and, uh, and these other places like Guantanamo. I mean, you know, I have my Ph.D. in Guantanamo. Now I have armed weapons from Canada and from and America and Britain. Isn't that great? And by the way, don't think the Canadians are lily white. They make a lot of weapons up there and they ship them all over the place in the open market. So do the Americans and the Brits. Brits just finished a massive contract to transfer weapons to the, quote, Syrian Free Army. And, of course, the latest is this air uh, zone that they want to create by getting Patriot 2 systems, parking them on the Syrian uh, border. Uh, what do you think of that? I mean, that's uh, trying to set up a de facto well, no-fly zone. They're, they're, they're setting up all the test pieces on the board to have a really big uh, destructive war. Dr. Bill, I'm going to run yeah. out of cell phone service here in about 60 seconds. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate so, you coming on. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for uh, bringing on Professor McCanny. And if there's any urgent reports, by the way, I'm going to resend you the uh, link for a live stream so you can put up live stream reports. And we're uh, doing some major live stream upgrades, so uh, we're going to have a lot of inf more information available for our listeners and viewers. So thanks a lot, John. Uh, Ann Morrison, you're there. I am here, Dr. Bill. Good. And, and I want uh, you to give us a kind of a capsule of what is going on. Uh, we all, you're the, our scientist and expert on space weather, uh, solar storms, uh, you know, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, sinkholes, and all the other Earth changes. What's happening? I want to talk about San Onofre first. Oh yeah, San, right. San Onofre. That's a that makes my skin crawl because it's only twelve miles away. Well, it's going to make your skin crawl. It's going to make your scalp crawl. They're yeah. investigating a case of potential sabotage, and what they found was that uh, a coolant was found in the oil can, and so if that, <clears throat> so if they had uh, used that for oiling, the uh, diesel generator, you know, the, the emergency diesel generator that they have on sign. Right. If, and if the generator had uh, been activated, then the uh, they say the governor, I'm not sure what that is, which controls the generator's speed and prevents it from running too fast when it fails. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it determines the fuel rate and the amount of uh, carburation, so how fast it's coming into the injector, yeah. So they might have had a runaway... Um, generator there, I guess. So in other words, if we got a station blackout like we had September 8th last year, we could have a backup generators blow, and San Onofre, which is sitting on 50 years of fuel, would go critical and uh, blow up. By the way, we know that all reactors, this is not some of them, but all reactors are dumping radiation, tritium, and they're all venting off other radioisotopes like thorium, etc. In fact, we had Dr. Bernhoff, who's here in California, and since, uh, since Fukushima Everyone he's testing, hair and uh, urine and blood tests, everyone is testing positive for thorium. So uh, guess what? We're all getting radioactive. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Not 10%, not 80%, 100% of all of his patients who tested are positive now. And uh, and we're talking on the break about a lot of things about uh, 
a weather manipulation. You know, Nishu Kaku talks about a zero-order culture, which he quote, says, we're a zero-order. Uh, I beg to differ with Dr. Michio Kako, the level one, tier one scientist, as Professor McKinney says. We are a tier one scientific community here in America, and the Russians are very closely behind. There's three other nations that have weather modification technology. We can precipitate earthquakes, storms. We can uh, precipitate volcanic eruptions. We can disrupt the ionosphere and the ozone layer. And you mentioned something about the ham radio operators, your hammer t- as well, that the last few years, the upper uh, reflective... Uh, area where they can bounce a signal using repeaters around the world has been dis- is not on, not on, and the reason for it is they're putting so dang much uh, nanoparticles and activating in the upper atmosphere. Everywhere you go, you see these uh, particles, and the way they work is thorium, which every by the way fifty every fifty atoms of thorium one is radioactive, barium, and aluminum are all what's called paramagnetic, and they're ideal for turning into a plasma. And that's how it works. And they do three things. They, they can steer storms. They can trigger uh, by pumping energy over a tectonic plate to create a piezoelectric slip. They can also insert frequencies that can affect life forms epigenetically on the planet. And they can also use as an EMP weapon to create plasma interferometry fields that can create a superheated plasma over a city equivalent to a 100 megaton weapon or more without any missile being launched anywhere on Earth within a matter of minutes. So uh, literally, the you know the death ray from the 25th century, Buck Rogers, we have it. We have weapon systems that are so deadly they can cover an entire continent and hit a specific epigenetic frequency for a life form, an organism. Uh, I mean, it really is scary what we have. And the problem is these other nations, like Russia, are now retooling, and so are the Chinese. There's a lot of industrial espionage. And unless we have a change of heart, we're not going to survive as a species on the planet because beside the Earth changes, which we're not cooperating on, we're not uh, cooperating on the uh, area of using science to defend the planet from near-Earth objects. Uh, Dr. McKinney talked about the uh, red hand of death, which he says is going to come in mid-January 2014, and that's the sign that happened at Moses, which caused the end of the uh, Second Kingdom in Egypt and the uh, volcanic eruption of Thera, and the final, uh, you know, some of the destruction of the ten plagues of Egypt. I mean, literally, that's coming. That happened 3,600 years ago, uh, in a little over a year. Amazing, hey? Eh? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, hi, Alexander. I want to hear Anne's response on that first, because you know, all the ultraviolet light changes, all the weather manipulation, like the storm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know uh, that. Uh, you know, Professor McKinney said, could not make a right-hand turn. This smells like crazy. I mean, they did everything from attack ads against Romney right through the convention to, uh, uh, you know, to, I think, election fraud. I'm pretty sure that some of the late votes were election fraud. Uh, to missing ballots. You know, they had a plane for coming from Afghanistan. It was going to bring them the ballots to our troops over there. The plane crashed, and they don't even give you reports where the plane is or they, where they sent a second plane with ballots for our troops. Our troops were denied, and by the way, they're going to vote basically 90, probably 90 plus percent for Romney. That's based on, on polls beforehand. So uh, we were dealing with a criminal cabal that will do, it re- do it will stop at nothing to create a dialectic of a whole new world order. And if people think it's a conspiracy theory, uh, I call it vicious ignorance. They're so ignorant they won't get out of their own way when they're put in chains and marched either to, toward the guillotine or toward their gruel at their table and, and given a transcortical death chip that if they don't behave, they're given a nanoparticle discharge of a neurotoxin that will kill them in seconds if they don't behave. And people say, they can't do that, Eagle. I beg to differ. Uh, All of this horrendous technology you might think is in sci-fi movies, we're capable of today and have been for decades. So, uh, and your comments about the the weather and about these other things before we get on with uh, Alexander. I think we lost our connection with Anne. Alexander, uh, your answer, and then we'll try to reconnect with Anne in a minute. Go ahead. Yeah, I can't hear Ann, but uh, what, what I see coming around the corner basically is that. I mean, uh, the Tesla-based technology that the Russians have and the U.S. has are, are not good. I mean, scalar weaponry, will, uh, scalar weaponry will be used in this war. It will be used. It's already being used in, in, to a certain extent. But as we see things, you know, heating up, 
we're going to see, instead of thermonuclear war, we're going to see the use of these technologies in order to weaken the, 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 the other nations. For example, Russia could uh, uh, bring down civilian aircraft over to the United States just by hitting a button and bringing down, let's say, 100 flights just by pushing one button. They have that technology now. And... Um, yeah, it, the, the thing is that people should understand they're, they're basically what we call information overload. And uh, I, I saw a video clip that was done by a good friend of mine, Jerry McLaughlin, from Clean TV. It was done for Western journalism. Mm-hmm. And I want to post up the link on that. Uh, and you're a really good analyst because you're, you're, you're able to look outside because you're living in, in Ensenadas, Mexico, and you're a journalist covering all the American issues. You know that they're preparing eventually, as Joel Skousen says, a full-forced invasion, probably six, eight, ten years from now, from China across the Mexican border into America. They're preparing uh, to sacrifice American uh, people by the tens of millions with uh, with a PDD-60 policy to not have a, a counter-strike against a nuclear attack on America. They're trying to collapse the economy so they can wipe out the middle class as much as Obama says he's going to help and he's going to give people Obama phones and everything else. Uh, you know, it really is very disturbing, and more disturbing than Obama is the the ignorance, the willful ignorance of people that believe that Obama is is for them, or that Obama isn't just a figurehead, and there's thousands of people in his regime and entourage that are doing all kinds of things. And what's interesting is there's that when there's going to do something really, really quickly and bad, one of the things you have to recognize is that now when we have the head of the CIA. Uh, General, I call him B. Treas. They say he's leaving because of a, of a, an affair. I'm thinking. Can you affair? believe that? No, no, that no, is come unbelievable on, news. No, I, I might what believe a that. What a man in the military we have, huh? <laughs> well, look, let, let's put it this way: uh, I could care, as they say, a rat's behind whether he has an affair or not. If he's a good general, and he's doing his right job. His personal issues that might go in 1950s or 60s, but here in 2012. What the heck are they doing using the excuse of an affair to try to remove a general unless they're planning on doing something he disagreed with strongly? And exactly. they said, well, we're just, we're just going to pluck your butt out of there, bud, because you're not going to go along with whatever we're going to do. Just like uh, the recent general they tried to attack and kill in one of the most highly secure bases. Uh, what was his name? General um, Dempsey. Dempsey. Uh, they tried to kill him a couple weeks ago just before the election, because he wouldn't go along with what was happening. I guarantee you that uh, this Ambassador Stevens, who was involved, because that, by the way, that base in, in Benghazi was the transshipment point for all these weapons coming into Benghazi before they're air flighted out uh, to Syria, to the Yeah, Turkish the arms Street. corridor to Syria, exactly. <laughs> right, so, yeah, he, he, he basically, this is what I used to see happen. They had this scamtastic scheme where he was going to be abducted, they're going to shade him for the blind shake, which is why the... the uh, you know, it was why, why the, surprise, right, September right, September why the terrorists were going to turn him over? They brought him to the hospital. Look, if I was a terrorist, do you think I'm going to take Ambassador Stevens and bring him to the hospital after he's getting inhalation ther- uh, exposure and he's dying? No, I'm going to put a bullet in his head, or I'm going to do it some other way to killing him, cut his throat. They didn't do that. These guys are compassionate. Oh my gosh, he's dying. We're supposed to save him and exchange him for the blind shake. Mm-hmm. And then what's going on? Stevens probably was one of their brown shirts, <clears throat> didn't go along with the full program like this, General Petraeus, and now he's going to be history. So Welcome back, and we had lost Ann's connection. We want to get your response on this weather manipulation, because we know, Sandy, there's another storm that slammed in yesterday, uh, last few days, too, in New York. Uh, that could have been turned away. Didn't need to hit people that now have lost their home and their belongings that are desperate. By the way, the response is disgusting from FEMA. Uh, and from uh, the Department of Homeland Security. By the way, they just kind of grab resources that are already there. So if the local people aren't prepared, including the state and the local people, citizens, they don't have resources. And if they do, they're certainly not moving at a pace that seems reasonable. Yeah, so, I heard uh, that, they, um, that the local police picked up the generators that people had uh, brought in to run their data banks, and uh, they just they just confiscated them and took them to run whatever FEMA wanted to run. Right, they just confiscate. Here, here's what they should have. I'm going to give a short list that FEMA should have, because I know FEMA listens, I know the government listens. They ask three questions. Who's on Deagle's show? What questions are they asking? And how the hell do they know the answer? <laughs> First thing is, number one, they should have four-season tents. Number two, they should have generators that run on diesel, and these are small ones. They should have what's called long-distance power cables, and we can get the, the more advanced ones that can carry power with a little power drop on. They should have large... 
uh, I would say 50 gallon drums full of full of water so they can bring those in there. They should have filtration systems. They should have porta potties they can bring in by helicopter. Uh, they should have uh, ways of, of having uh, you know safe heaters so people don't die of carbon monoxide. When they had the ice storm up in Quebec back many years ago, uh, more people died of, of carbon monoxide poisoning from having uh, space heaters inside their home than anything else. So, well, they want to go on the Red Cross model, and the Red Cross model says put them into a tent city, and that's what they've done. And they haven't yeah. delivered. I mean, they could have been putting Well, first off, you don't need a tent city. Firstly, you can put them, their tents can be anywhere. Their tents can be not a tent city. They can be in, a, in an area that's right by their home in their backyard. Exactly. You know, the fact is they lost their power. A lot of these people weren't, didn't have their home destroyed. They just lost power. Yeah. Uh, and what they need now is to have power restored. So a pile of these small little generators uh, uh, with cables, almost like what I call the, the, what they did in Baghdad. I call Baghdad's, Baghdadization, where you got hundreds of, of entrepreneurs just got these small generators, and they run cables like spider webs everywhere. You could easily okay. do that. But you don't have to park them all in one area like a military place because what they want to do is tenderize people to the idea of martial law. And uh, if it's another disaster, which you know Obama and his maniacs could trigger off an earthquake, like in California, they could trigger off a New Madrid quake with a big nuclear, uh, uh, you know, core meltdown and, and massive radiation release, or American Fukushima. They could have a massive plague release, which we know is bioengineered. By the way, <coughs> Fort, Fort Calhoun went down during the flooding two years ago, and it's yep. still not working. Well, there's a number of these reactors that are still on backup. Uh, I think Oyster Creek was having major problems with a couple other reactors in uh, New York. And it proved that basically they don't have any preparation. If there ever was anything longer than two weeks, which is their fuel, their fuel storage depot, if anything happened, even just roads blown or disrupted from earthquakes, volcanoes, or bad weather, these reactors are going to blow all over the place. And, uh, you know, it, it's not just bad planning. This is on purpose. Because you could have pre-placed all these tents and generators. You could have the heavy lift military helicopters come in and drop them. You could have, uh, you know, it's easy to take control of the situation to make sure people have food, water, uh, you know, dehydrated food, water, and everything, and have their needs taken care of and have electricity back. Um, well, okay. Part of the problem is that, uh, I don't know if you know it, but we're going through a meteor shower now, and it's called the Torrid Meteor Shower. And, oh, yes. Okay. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. And the meteors are coming in as fireballs. Now, normally when you see a meteor shower, you see something that looks like a star. And um, <clears throat> this, these are the debris in the orbit of the Earth from the comet Enki. And, oh, really? Uh, so, every year, so every year we go through this debris from this comet, and they're called the Torrid um, meteor shower. Well, this year they're fireballs. Now, what does that tell you? That means that they're getting lower in the atmosphere because we're seeing them. The, this was in San Francisco. The fireball was a hundred times brighter than the full moon, and and that means that it was that it was it wasn't a little star. It was a big fireball. And uh, if you think that that's not a problem, you know, next year they may be hitting the Earth. Well, well uh, it's true yeah. that these things are are about the size of gravel, whatever that is. I mean, there's all sorts of sizes of gravel. But the torrids uh, come in at 17 miles per second. Now, a piece of gravel that hits you at 17 miles per second is going to do some damage. And, um, the, for instance, the other meteor shower that we just went through were the or Orionids. And they're faster. They're, they come in at 41 miles per second, but they were higher up. They're, they're a lot softer than the, than the torrids. So uh, the reason I think that these, these gravelly um, meteorites are coming down as, as close to the Earth that we're seeing them as fireballs is because something's wrong with the atmosphere. There's not as much atmosphere to uh, burn them up higher up. And NASA is actually. So you're, you mentioned this before about you mentioned this before about the thermosphere, which uh, maybe there's something happening to the thermosphere, which is the atmosphere from like a hundred thousand feet up to you know fifty, sixty miles or more. The thermosphere has has uh, reconstituted itself, so it's no longer um, extinguished, and it is spreading out. So no, this is, this is not a thermosphere problem. 
But anyway, NASA wants you to uh, count the fire, fireballs that you see and send it into them. And they even have an app now available for Apple and Android devices that you can use to send meteor um, fireball counts to them. I mean, I think they're getting desperate. Uh, I'll tell you what's going on. We're going to have Professor McCanny on every week because he said a lot of hot stuff's going to happen. We've got 2012 DA14 going to literally pass the Earth under 5,000 miles on my birthday, and they stopped giving the date out in May. Their first calculations a couple of years ago were going to be half the lunar distance, or you know, one half LD. Now it's under 5,000. That's in May. My guess is this object is going to be a heck of a lot closer. Plus, it's going to have a debris field around that's going to strike the Earth. Then we have this giant object called the uh, 2012 S1 uh, that's 25 kilometers at least across, big. And it's going to, the, the uh, tail of it is actually going to cross through Mars in October, but it's going to pass through Earth. We're going to pass through the tail uh, with a debris field in January. And according to Dr. McCann, Professor McCann, he thinks this is the uh, ancient prophetic uh, red hand of death, the exact sign in the heavens that occurred at the time of Moses. So... Uh, that hasn't happened in the last 500, 1,000, 2,000 years. This hasn't happened since Moses. That's 3,600 years ago. That's a long time. I think that we all better be uh, ready to go under underground. You know, they're talking to the astrophysicists, the uh, people that are doing the, the sun watching, and they, they want more amateur people to uh, use solar uh, telescopes because they... <laughs> Sometimes they miss flares and things, and, and they don't, uh, for some reason, I don't know why. they. I guess they're cutting down on manpower. Maybe they're not taking as many pictures. But anyway, um, the, uh, the ultraviolet light is also getting down to the ground, and they're really afraid that there's going to be a Carrington event next summer. And if that happens, um, we'll all have to go underground because that's the only thing that will block the UV Let's talk about this. What's the Carrington event? <clears throat> For those who haven't listened to the program, that's the 1859 event that caused a massive spike of a coronal mass ejection that caused auroras right down to the equator, uh, stripped the atmosphere of its magnetic field, and caused a massive surge in ultraviolet light. Uh, and you could read a newspaper at midnight uh, that day. But it also is going to cause very major effects for the next number of days of radiation bathing the Earth, too, isn't it? Yes, and the, the, they rate it now as an X-54. Remember that the X scale uh, goes, there's two scales for the X band. It goes B, C, M, and then there's X1 and X2. And that's how you get to uh, X, X-54. Uh, at an X-54, and then you, you, so that's the scale, that's the intensity, but then you also have to think about the duration. And we had a flare recently that took seven and a half hours it was pouring off the sun for seven and a half hours, and that was the one that caused the aurora to come down as far south as Illinois. So, wow. so you have to look at both how big it is, and that was only an M flare. It wasn't a big flare. It wasn't an X flare. It's the duration it that counts. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Amazing. Back in a moment with uh, Alexander Bachman and Morrison and. Earth changes, civil defense, martial law, and more. Yeah. Welcome back, and and you had some very important things to say. It's uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, and others. They're saying next summer is very probably going to be a Carrington-like. Uh, F or X-59 uh, coronal mass ejection, which means if you don't have alternative power, and I tell people the very minimum to start with is get a 20 kW generator with propane tanks. Get solar with backup lithium pyrophosphate batteries. We're looking at two solar technologies. One is called V3 Solar, which will be launching in the first quarter. It will be in full production by the second or third quarter. It's the most advanced technology. The other one is called the Zenith Solar out of Israel, and they do have American distributors I've been in contact with. They track the sun, and they're about 20 times more efficient. The V3 solar is a little dome. Each one can generate a kilowatt of power. It's only about two feet across and about two and a half feet high, and it spins. Uh, it pumps the electrons so it doesn't need an inverter. Now, these with lithium pyrophosphate batteries, you're off the grid because the grid's going, people, and there's nothing more effective than the grid going. Uh, to bring in either martial law or dependence on backup generators and the government. 
Well, the um, the Solar Cycle 24 prediction panel uh, reached a consensus that the solar maximum would occur in May 2013, and uh, a supermajority of the panel did agree to that prediction. Now, they did say it was going to be less than Solar Cycle uh, 23, that it wasn't going to be as active. And uh, um, if, if you go up to the NASA JPL website, you can, I mean, they've got plots there that show you uh, how they predicted it and then also what's happening, you know, the monthly values. So, uh, and it seems to be following what they said. Uh, it's, uh, so, but they are expecting a, a, a quarantine-like event sometime in the next two years. Now, it might not, I mean, <laughs> these things are average. And any, this window is two years wide. In other words, you get 2013 May, and you, then you go 2012 May to 2014 May, and all that time is, is solar maximum. So it could happen any time in the next uh, year and a half. Uh, yeah, and I have a feeling that's what's going on. By the way, one of the things I, when I work with uh, the hazmat teams in Colorado in the late 90s, the very first thing the government will do under any national disaster, it can be a medical waste bomb in downtown Atlanta or Denver, uh, it can be a, a you know release of you know bird flu or avian swine flu coming in through San Francisco. In any disaster of any kind, the very first thing they're going to do is, guess what? Switch off the grid. So if it doesn't go, they're going to make it go. They could have hardened for cost uh, North America of about, I think, around two or $300 million to actually harden the grid against CMEs. They didn't do it. And it was actually uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski, who was a, a rhino Republican up in Alaska, that actually blocked it. So we, we got a desperate situation, and we're, we're up against it now. We have a know-nothing, do-nothing president that preens around like a peacock. Uh, I mean, it really is disgusting how this election went. No, fact, he now got, cries. He now cries. Oh, yeah, he's even able to cry. I mean, now that's crocodile tears. There's a, by the way, if you go to uh, Western Journalism, there's a new uh, e-book e out on Kindle called An Illegal President, a novel by Pat Lawrence. And it's a gripping, gripping to censor about corrupted presidential campaign. We know this whole campaign, including even the selection of Romney. Romney could have been managed better. I mean, his, his management team was a bunch of idiots. He should have dealt with the uh, Hispanic population. As I said, a three-point plan for Hispanics. Number one, rapid immigration policy, so you don't have to have a lawyer with uh, communication, <clears throat> so you, you can speed this process. You don't go and say, well, we're going to just, you know, through an executive order, suspend for two years the deportation of young people. Their parents were terrified they were going to be deported. Secondly, uh, what you do is you eject people out that have criminal uh, records, whether they've been in the military service or not, that are in the country that are Hispanic. In other words, you remove dangerous illegals from the country. And third, <clears throat> you have a policy of, of screening everybody through the, that comes through the borders, whether they're coming through the driveway border or across the San Diego or through the airports, and you profile. Uh, and uh, we, we, it would be easy to, to fix this problem. So that's the Hispanic issue. The women's issue should have been, we are pro-life, <clears throat> We and the way you approach it is this, you can have non-abortive uh, birth control technology. We do not support uh, fetal tissue research and abortion. We are going to defund uh, Planned Parenthood, but our goal is we want to support women and distressed pregnant mothers. I've worked for years in, in supporting distressed pregnant mothers, but we need to start with a society that's so immoral, and they throw women aside, like, oh, well, too bad you have a child. And, of course, the distressed mother, often the boyfriend or the husband, says, well, you have to have an abortion now. <clears throat> so we have a, a situation where the president or the presidential candidates didn't want to deal with this issue straight up. They made stupid comments like it was God's will that the woman would get raped. And it's never God's will that someone can go through a traumatic experience. But having her go through an abortion doubles the trauma because it's her baby as well. And it's a person. Whether it was conceived by abortion or not, it's still a human being. The problem is personhood is not dependent on how you got here, including a human person that's grown in a dish as a clone. Okay, So people need to understand that. And this is going to come up because in China, and one of the things that I had a recent vision of just the other night was in China, I know this from my, my contacts as well, they have hundreds of thousands of cloned, genetically selected human beings growing in China right now. It's really crazy. 
and they're doing everything. They want to do genetic upgrading. They want to do all kinds of things. And the and these other countries, one of the reasons why the Japanese are being really quiet is behind the scenes, the Japanese are playing around with cloning and genetic engineering because eventually the state is going to take over reproduction. I can't stress this to women enough. The, there was a gender gap supporting Obama. But they don't realize they're not going to get the right to abortion. They're going to lose the right to even reproduce. It's going to get taken over by the state. Well, scientists even, have said in their secret little labs over there at Berkeley and at Livermore <clears throat> that uh, definitely, I mean, they have artificial wombs where they have uh, embryos uh, hanging from the ceiling there, mm-hmm. and they say, we don't need women anymore. We don't. In fact, uh, if people say, Dr. Deagle, you don't know how to do this, I can give them an equipment list. For a cost of a boat, uh, maybe $1 to $2 million, I could set up a clone lab tomorrow. I need about 7,000 square feet. I need uh, climate control, I need a certain types of equipment, and I can give an equipment list. Some people say, you can't clone human beings. Uh, okay, I'll give you some of the lists. You need a phase contrast microscope, but you can do micropipetting so you can remove the DNA from an egg and insert the DNA from another person. You can even get it from skin cells or bone marrow from another person. You need to be able to grow up a blastula. You can even split the blastula if you want to create multiple clones. Once you have a blastula phase, you can split it at 32 or 64 cells. You grow it in an artificial uterus where you create this membrane where the uh, the trophoblast literally interdigitates with this bubble membrane that literally is a, 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 an ECMO membrane that will literally act as like the mother's uterine wall, and the thing just starts growing, and you can actually look at these things while they're growing, uh, playing around, sucking their thumb, actually in, inside there. So people say oh, they can't do it. George Washington University uh, was doing research back in the 70s, the University of Palma, Italy, and the Pope actually made an order to tell them to shut it down over 30 years ago. So people say they can't do it. I'm thinking, I'm sorry, as it says in the book of Genesis, nothing will be withheld from their imagination. Now they are of one tongue, and, and, and uh, you know, mankind is literally, I, the way I try to tell people, what, what is a human being? A human being is God incarnate in physical flesh trying to recover from amnesia. It's just that there's a real arms race, and you're totally right, Bill. There's a real arms race, and this arms race has to do with creating all these new genetic technologies where they will create super soldiers and modify the human race. So uh, the end date, according to DARPA, was December 2012. Whoever got the technology to perfect and splice human beings would be the leader uh, in the next uh, world war that we're going to all witness. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So... Uh, and any comments you have on this? Because I think people need to realize that we're much farther along the rabbit trail than they can imagine. Well, I think the comment that was made on uh, national television that men consider uh, women uh, di- disposable sex toys. You know, they, I think that's extremely don't. disturbing. You see, this is why if you have an immoral society, it's going to destroy itself. Women should be rejoiced, should be treated with great respect, should get equal pay for equal work, should have equal access to become doctors and lawyers and scientists. Women should know that uh, that we're going to protect them if they happen to become pregnant. We're going to support and protect them, but we're also going to not authorize them to be, have multiple children from multiple boyfriends, which is what we're seeing in the inner city. We want to have a situation where, where morality comes back, where we have not abortive birth control technologies so that people don't have to be continuously pregnant either. And there's simple ways of doing that with a valve at the uh, uterine uh, junction easily put in there. Uh, You know, there's no need for the abuse of women. This is what's happened to the Republican Party and with their approach toward immigration. Good, hardworking, decent people that want to come here to work, let them come. If we have the resources, if we have the strong, hardworking people, We can easily handle a larger population, but we have to also control who comes here and who should not be in America. And that's easy to solve, but we have to do profiling. We have to make sure we remove things like Sharia law from our mosques in America. Not a problem to have Muslims here, but let's be no Sharia law, no jihad zone. 